And of course, the creek meandered through this ravine. And Shelly, thank you, because I think that movement exercise was a really great way of reminding us, especially the swimming, that actually we've heard stories of people that people did used to swim here at the bottom uh, in the creek below this bridge that is actually in front of us here. So you can see here, you know, you can read traces of the Garrison Ravine in the city through parks like Bickford Park. In just a moment, I'm going to pass the microphone to Todd, and he can tell you a little bit about um, how how groups across the city are trying to, or their efforts in renaturalizing the, the remnant ravine system. But first, I just want to show you this this piece of concrete here, and if you've ever biked or walked down Harvard before, you have probably noticed it. And uh, like myself, uh, for uh, years I would just go by it and wouldn't really think twice about it. But this is actually um, what is left of the Harvard Bridge. Actually, the whole bridge is there. It's buried underneath this ground here. And it was built back in 1905. And only 25 years later, it was buried with fill just to encourage development uh, along this area. So they would have they would have leveled this part of the city so that they could build houses. And that was a common way of developing cities. Unfortunately, we still do that when you see suburbs being built. Uh, a lot of the land is leveled. And so here is a trace of this bridge, um, built in 1905, buried in 1930. Uh, it's a pretty special spot. And uh, there, are, there are people in the city who would love to excavate this bridge to actually um, <laughs> do a little guerrilla excavation uh, to expose, you know, the, the beautiful arches underneath. So if you ever get bored in the middle of the night and you've got a, a good <laughs> shovel, you know, there's an idea, a suggestion for you. There are other people in the city who'd like to do that. And uh, I'm going to pass the over to that tree, and we're going to stay looking at me, and Margaret and I are going to stay looking at you. We're going to reach both hands over to that tree, and we're going to come up. And then we're going to reach way over to that lovely person in orange on the side. We're going to reach all of our hands over to him and say, come on and join us. And we're going to reach our hands up. Then we're going to put our hands on our hips. We're going to put our heel out in front of us and our toes facing way up to the sky. We're going to reach our hands way up. Then reach them way out towards me and more reach towards you. And then reach them all the way down to your toes. And while you're down, reaching as far as you can, even if that's here, we're going to take a deep breath in. And breathe out. And a collective breath in. And a collective breath out. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> 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 
give uh, guided tours in collaboration with community groups across the city telling stories about the urban forest. And so um, the urban forest is obviously uh, it's an important way of trying to read kind of the topography of the city. And uh, Todd's going to do that right now. Thanks, Lynn. Um, what I wanted to point out is if you look back behind us here, we are imagining there was a ravine running through here and water and it was coming underneath this bridge. But with that, something we often forget is there was also a lot of ecological features as well beyond just the river. And it was made up primarily of trees. This is what we would have called a mixed hardwood forest around here. The entire area would have been covered by forest at one time before settlement. And uh, the river would have meandered in a much more, you know, flowing way. And the trees would have come right from the edge of the, the bank. And you would have had, like, silver maple trees that are reaching out and, and almost touching the water. If you ever gone canoeing in Algonquin Park or something, it would be quite similar. You'd have a mix of trees along the bank. Uh, white pines were really common. They were about 130 feet tall. They created what was called the, the super canopy, where they'd be these really tall trees. And the rest of the trees would be about 80 feet to 100 feet tall at the most. There would be oaks, uh, sugar maples, um, uh, silver birches, um, hemlock, a real mix of different variety of trees. And then when the settlers came, they did this very strange thing, that they didn't only like dam up the river, which was pretty strange in itself, but they also cut down the majority of the trees. And what they often did is they put back a much more uh, manicured looking uh, design afterwards, which was often turf, and then they would plant trees again, but for whatever reason, they wouldn't plant the trees that they cut down. So up beside us here, we have um, a Norway maple tree. And over here, we have a honey locust and another Norway maple. And all these trees are not from this area. Honey locusts are pretty close, but Norway maples are from... Can anyone guess? Can any of the kids guess where Norway maples are from? Anyhow. They're from Iceland, yes. No, they're from Norway. Um, and the problem is with this is that these non-native trees can cause real problems for the existing ecological systems. They get into our ravines and they kind of take over and, and kill off everything else. So what we're trying to do is, is put back the forest that was here. And the problem is it's much easier to cut down a forest. It takes about you know two or three days with a lot of big machinery. But to put it back takes a lot of hard work. And usually you use little shovels and you dig little holes and you plant little plants and you wait a long time and you're really patient. And there's a group of people who are working on this park, they're called the Friends of Bickford Park. And if you look around, you'll see some young trees. And these were all planted by local citizens with a, an, an initiative to try to put back what was here. So not only should we be thinking about the forest, the, the river that was running through here, but also the network of other ecological features that met that river. And you can even see how some of that back corner there, it's all growing back. And in some time, you'll see a beautiful forest edge again all along here with different colored leaves in the fall versus just having the occasional landscape tree that was from another part of the world. So it's really exciting to see groups doing that. It's a lot of work, but uh, they're doing it all over the state. There's over 300 groups in Toronto that are doing work to restore the ravines. And little, uh, often very little projects, sometimes quite large, but it's a, a really exciting thing. And now all we need to do is get another group of people with shovels, as Liz said, and start digging up the, uh, the river. But that's, that's a lot more work, so we'll see how long it takes. Anyway, I think that's all for this stop. <laughs>